<laughs> Six o'clock. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Everybody awake right now? See if we can't keep it that way. We'll do our best anyway. Um, hope everybody had a good Sunday afternoon. Um, I know I did, and I hope you did. Let's all stand together. First thing, get up, get a little blood flow going, and we'll uh, pray and ask God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just uh, thank you so much for this day that you've given to us, Lord. We thank you for those who, uh, who made decisions this morning. And uh, God, we pray that you'll just bless them and just continue to, to speak to each one of us, God, that we will all just uh, follow your, uh, 
your leading. And uh, God, that we will be obedient in whatever it is that you're telling us. And God, we just pray that tonight you will just speak to our hearts. Uh, Lord, that uh, you would just have your way in this place. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay, you want to stay standing and sing? Yeah, let's stay standing for, and sing. Right. Hey, check that lead mic. Hey, check. The, uh, there we go. A little bit. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. My, am I at the right key? It's A flat for you, right? I think it's A flat. It's an A flat. Sorry, that's what happens when Angela's not here. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace.
Well, this week we get to look at the second church in the seven churches of Asia that Jesus spoke to uh, through his revelation in uh, chapter 2 of the book of Revelation. Uh, Tonight we'll be looking at verses 8 through 11. Last week he spoke to which church was it? The Ephesians. Very good. The church at Ephesus. And to the church at Ephesus, he gave them some compliments. And then he gave them a criticism that they had lost the love they had at first. And then he gave them one more compliment. Tonight, to the church at Smyrna, he gives no criticism. Only encouragement. To the church in Smyrna, he tells them that they have some things that are coming up. And they need to be ready. And they need to be brave. Smyrna was a coastal city 40 miles north of Ephesus. So going from Patmos, the first city you would come to would be Ephesus. Then Smyrna was on up the coast about 40 miles north of Ephesus. It was a very wealthy city. Had a lot of Jewish inhabitants. All right, It was established in about 1200 B.C. It was a pretty old city. But it was pretty much demolished in 627 and it was left in ruins for about 400 years. Then Alexander the Great had an idea. He wanted to rebuild Smyrna and make it a great city once again. After his death, his plans were carried out and Smyrna was built into a beautiful city. It was known as the glory of Asia, the finest city in Asia Minor. Smyrna was the center of worship for Dionysus, uh, a Greek god, and also was chosen by Rome to be honored by having the temple to Tiberius built there. Smyrna was a rich, worldly place. And in the midst of this rich and very worldly place, we have some Christians serving God. And as we read, beginning in verse 8, if you all stand with me, in chapter 2, verses 8 through 11, It's a short letter to the church in Smyrna. And Jesus said, beginning in verse 8, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful even unto death. And I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here together tonight and study your word. Thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our hearts tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Now, I told you that it was the center center of temple worship for Dionysus, uh, a Greek and mostly a Roman god. The Romans were very uh, twisted in their worship and in the uh the town of smyrna there was a temple there to dionysus and jesus says some things that stand out particularly considering who he was talking to people in the town of smyrna he said to tell them that the first and the last is the one who is speaking the first and the last the great i am He is speaking of His eternality. He was before anything and before everything. And He would be after everything else. He said, who died and is alive. Every year, the priests at the temple to Dionysus would portray a mock resurrection of Dionysus every year. Where they would pretend to be Dionysus rising from the grave. And Jesus says, The one who was dead and is alive. The one. Dionysus, that was a mock thing that the priests there 
that that temple went through every year. But Jesus said, I actually am the one who died and rose from the grave. Considering what was going on in Smyrna, they saw a mock, a mockery of a resurrection carried on and carried out by those priests every year. Something that never really happened to a God who never really existed. And Jesus said, I am the first and the last. I was before anything. I will be after everything. And I actually was dead and am alive. There's a big contrast. And Jesus points that out with His words. Now, He says to them, He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Smyrna was a rich town. Very wealthy, wealthy town. And as all of us know, in Arkansas, if you make $150 a week and you're trying to support your family on that, you are poor. But, in some countries in, America, in the world, if you make $150 a week, you're the richest guy in town. Right? So not only were these guys poor, going through poverty because of the persecution they were suffering, but they were doing it in the midst of very wealthy people. And when you're around wealthy people, your poverty seems all the greater, doesn't it? He said, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but... You are rich. They were suffering, but they were not alone. They were poor in the things of the world, but rich in the things of God. Y'all remember Jesus telling the story of Lazarus and the rich man? Remember what happened to the rich man? And remember what happened with Lazarus? The rich man died also and opened his eyes, and there he was being tormented in hell. Why? Because he was rich? No, because he was poor in the things of God. And there we see Lazarus. He's carried off by the angels and he wakes up in Abraham's bosom. Why? Because he was poor? No, because he was rich in the things of God. Some are rich in worldly things. And in the long run, that really doesn't matter either way. You can be rich in worldly things and, be full, and also be rich in the things of God. Rich in faith and rich in the wealth doesn't make that big a difference in the big picture. But if you're poor in faith and poor in the things of God, then you are poor indeed. Well, these guys, they were poor in the things of the world, but they were rich in the things of God. He said, and I know the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. There were a lot of Jews in Smyrna, a lot of Jews, Hebrews by birth. Jesus says, they say they're Jews because they are of the bloodline of Abraham, but they are not God's chosen people because they have rejected Christ. I want you to look. You don't have to look. I'll read it to you. In Romans, if I can find it. Suspense is killing you, isn't it? In Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, he says, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. These guys were Jews in blood, but they weren't Jews in faith. Jesus not only said, are they not Jews? He said, they are a synagogue of Satan. Now listen to me. That's not a compliment. That's about as harsh a criticism as a man can get from Jesus Christ. As a group of people can get from Jesus Christ. To be called a synagogue of Satan. They were an assembly of the devil. Alright? They were Jews in blood. But that was it. They claimed to be God's chosen people because they were sons of Abraham, but they were not God's chosen people because they had rejected God's one and only Son. Tradition says that the, uh, the uh, martyr Poly Polycarp, who was very you know, well-known, uh, and he was at one, eventually he became the pastor of the church in Smyrna, and these same Jews in Smyrna in 166 A.D., 
88 years after Polycarp's, or 86 years after Polycarp's conversion, he had been serving in Smyrna. He had been pastoring the church in Smyrna. And these Jews were still around. And they still hated Christians. And they carried the logs for the fire to burn Polycarp at the stake. Because first they said, let's feed him to the lions. But they didn't have any lions available. So they said, all right, well, I'll tell you what. Let's bury him alive. And that kind of got shot down too. So they ended up burning him alive. And those Jews were the first ones to carry logs for the fire. They hated Christianity and Christians. They were a group that belonged to Satan. Now, in verse 10, Jesus says, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you the crown of light, life. Okay, Satan is behind this coming persecution. He is the one that is causing it to happen. He says, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. Alright? The devil was behind this persecution. He was behind this tribulation that they were about to go through. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. His power is limited. My power is not. The worst He can do to you, the very worst thing that He can do to you, as soon as He does it, it'll be over and you'll be with me. The very worst thing you have to fear from Him is something that I've already taken care of. Don't be afraid. His power is limited. Mine is not. At the end of the life of a priest of Dionysus, they placed a crown on his head and carried him through the streets. And Jesus says, I'm not offering you that kind of crown. I'm offering you the crown of life. That was a crown of death. They put a crown of death on the priests of Dionysus in Smyrna and they would carry him through the streets when they passed away. And that, as some sort of celebrating their death. And Jesus said, look, I'm not offering you death. I'm offering you life. I'm going to give you a crown of life. Jesus, His power is limitless. Satan's persecution would be limited. Ten days, he says. And then as he does in most of these letters, he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now I think it's important, I'm going to point this out now, and I'm not going to hit it every week. But he says, what? He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What Jesus is saying to these churches, He's saying to all churches, I think, we can get from that, right? He is saying this to the churches. Now, we may go through persecution, and we may go through tribulation, and He said, don't be afraid, because the power of this world, the power of, of the devil is limited. Mine is not. I will be with you no matter what. And I have given you, if you've trusted in me already, the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Listen, he says. Listen, be encouraged. And know that he who has believed on the Son will not suffer the second death. And we know from later on in Revelation what the second death is. The second death is eternal death. But Jesus has given to those who believe eternal life. And when you have eternal life, you don't have to worry about eternal death. The second death can't touch you. A reference back to the fact that some of these people at the church of Smyrna may suffer unto death. He said, be faithful even unto death. They may lose their lives in this tribulation that they're going through and, they're, and what they're fixing to suffer, this persecution. They may lose their lives in that. Their lives in that. Uh, but death for them is swallowed up in what? Victory. Right? Death has been swallowed up in victory. And I think it's important as we look at this church and this letter to this church to look back at 2 Timothy chapter 1. And Paul's writing to his friend, Timothy. His child in the faith. 
this young man that Paul has taken under his wing and has, has helped along the way, has made a pastor uh, uh, and, and is giving him all the support, all the encouragement, all the advice. He is a mentor to Timothy. He loves Timothy. And as he's talking to Timothy, he says something that I think Jesus is saying here to the church at Smyrna, and I believe we need to understand that he is saying to each one of us as well, don't be afraid. We've just finished studying the life of Joseph. Joseph had every reason to be afraid over and over and over, but he always knew God was with him. He didn't huddle down and cry. He carried on. Carried the, kept the faith and knew that God was with him. God does not cause us fear in that way. We are to fear God in a healthy respect, right? You better fear God in that way. But to have a spirit of fear is not from God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, for God, gave us, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. To the church at Smyrna, Jesus said, listen, don't be afraid. I'm with you. I have given you eternal life and through all that this devil might throw at you, I'm there. Don't be afraid. For all of us facing, who knows what we're facing. I mean, everyone in this room is facing something different. As a church, we face things every week and every month. We're always facing difficulties. We're facing trials and tests in our personal life, in our congregational life. It's just part of it. Remember what Jesus said in this life. You will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He said you will. And that has proven to be true. We do. But He said don't be afraid. Because I'm with you. I'm always with you. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. So when you get afraid, and you say, I know that I need to make this decision based on God's Word, but I'm scared. And I know if I make this other decision based on the worldly wisdom of those around me that I won't have to be afraid of failure or this or that. But let me tell you something. That's a test. Don't be afraid to follow and to trust in God. I know most of you have probably seen that movie, Courageous. It's a cool movie. Really cool movie. Really neat movie. And there's a little... A uh, guy from Mexico, his name's Javier, and Javier gets called into the uh, the owner of, the, the, of his factory where he works, and he gives him a test. He says, "Hey, Javier, you like your job? Oh, yes, sir. I love this job." He said, "Well, I, want, I need a supervisor. I'm gonna put you over the the receiving dock. Next Tuesday, I'm gonna get a shipment in of five crates, but I want you to write down only four crates." And Javier's like, "What?" That's not, fair. That's not honest. That's not right. He said, do you want to be on my team, Javier? He says, yeah. He says, well, you need to think about that. You can come back in here in the morning and give me your answer. And Javier needs this job. He's got a wife and two kids, and he's their only support. He needs it. He's afraid to do the right thing. And he believes if he does what's wrong in his heart, that the job will be okay, and he'll be able to take care of his family. It's real easy to rationalize Hey, it's this guy, he's the owner, if, you know, it's his stuff. If he wants to lie, you know, whatever. And Javier comes back in the next morning. And the guy says, have you made your decision? And Javier says, yes, I have. I love this, this company, I love my job, and I really appreciate it. But I cannot do what is dishonoring to my God. And his boss says, that's the right answer, Javier. I've been looking for an honest man, and I've called however many people in here, and you're the first one that stood up for what was right. And he gave him the job. Now listen, when we're faced with those kind of situations, that was a written deal, right? And somebody wrote that. That was part of the script. But in, re in the real world, in our real lives, those kind of things happen all the time. We get put into situations where we feel like the smart thing is to go against God. But recognize that's not the smart thing. And when we do that, it's not because we're smart or because we're wise. It's because we're scared. Every time. 
we're afraid that God will not come through for us. God will. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. The church at Smyrna was fixing to go through some stuff that we probably can't even imagine. And he said, don't be afraid. Persevere. Be strong. Keep the faith. And I have for you a crown of life. Even if the devil takes your life through this persecution, even if you're put in a prison, even if you die there, I've got you covered. Put your faith in me, is what Jesus said. And don't be afraid. So I know this week some of us are going to be faced with situations just like that. Faced with situations where we're afraid. We know what's right. What God's Word says. But we're scared that God's going to let us down. And we need to recognize that He won't. Did God let Joseph down when he was thrown into the pit? You might say, well, he was put into slavery, so man, I don't know. Well, when he was sold into slavery and he stood up for what was right with Potiphar's wife, did God let him down then? You might say, well, sort of, because he went to prison. Right? And then when he was in prison, you may say, you know, he, he did what was right, he did what was right with the baker and the butler, and he did what was right. Did God let him down then? You might say, well, sort of, because he's... The butler forgot about him for two years. But when you look at the big picture, God was with him all the way through. God never let him down. God moved him along the line where he needed to go so that he would be in the situation and in the position that he ended up in in order that he could save his people, his whole family, and that he could be a guy who 3,000 some odd years later, we're still talking about. God never let him down. And God never will. God is God. And God is good. Have faith in that. And don't be afraid. To the church at Smyrna, he said, don't be afraid. To the church at Crossroads, don't be afraid. Stand with me. We'll have a short moment, short time of response. And know that there may be some of us here tonight who are facing something right now and we're afraid and I don't mean to make little of that because there are some things in this life that are scary things like cancer things like not knowing how you're going to feed your family things like decisions that you know are going to affect every day for the rest of your life those are scary things but it's when you're scared and you put your faith in God and you trust in Jesus. That's when it really matters. It's take, making the hard decisions when you're afraid. That's what real courage is. That's what real faith is. So if you're dealing with something tonight, you need to talk to me, you need to come up and pray. You just need to to pray and, and talk to God right where you're at. Whatever it is that God may be speaking to somebody in this room about tonight. Take care of it. Right now. And that's not to say once you do it's going to go away and everything will be all sunshine and daisies from now on. But it's a step in the right direction. It's leaning on God now and trusting that He's still going to be there tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's a daily decision. To trust God. And make every decision that you make based on the fact that He is with you. That He is God. And that He is good. Heavenly Father, God, thank You so much for this time together. Lord, I pray as You continue to speak to our hearts, Lord, that uh, each one of us, Lord, will just uh, hear You clearly. That we will respond in obedience. And that we will all be encouraged to know that fear, whatever fear we may be going through, whatever we may be afraid of, Lord, that that fear and that spirit of fear does not come from you because you give us a spirit of power, of love, of self-control. And you've told us that you will never leave us, never abandon us. 
and that we can always, always trust in you. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. This is your time to respond as the Lord leads you.